everyone. Today, I am so happy to have back with me my favorite journalist, historian, and author, Robert Clara. Thank you so much, Robert, for talking to me again. Thanks, Michelle. It's good to be with you. Yeah, we had talked earlier about your new book, which was The Devil's Mercedes, which I just loved. And Thank that's you. why I had to read all your other books. <laughs> so I begged you to come back to talk about FDR's funeral train, and then you agreed, and I'm so happy you agreed. Talk to me. Oh, well, listen, it, 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 that book is a few years in the rearview mirror for me, so anytime there's renewed interest, is uh, I'm, I'm happy to comply. Well, I first of all, I love everything um, history-wise about World War II. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's my enjoy. favorite period, too. It's, it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. It, it really does. And you know what? I've read so many, like recently, this book was published in 2010. But I yep. have to say within the next, within the last year, I have read more books about World War II history than any other year. And I don't know if it's just because I'm looking more into it, but I feel like more and more are coming out. I and know. I've noticed that, too. And I, I have wondered why. I mean, I kind of take it back to I forget what year Saving Private Ryan came out, but that seemed to have opened the doors uh, in earnest. And, um, uh, I mean, I, I just joined that stampede. Um, I, I think part of the reason is that there, there, was no, there was no question that the United States and the Allies were in the moral right in that war, and it doesn't hurt that we won it either. So there's a certain, you know, moral certitude uh, and, and, and feeling of national reinforcement that takes place when you take that subject on. And I think a lot of people need to feel good, uh, understandably, about those things these days when, uh, when the political climate is, is so much more complicated and ambiguous. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it does just keep – I mean, the stories are endless, I feel like. Like there are just so many different aspects of that time period that, you know, that I've read recently. And I interviewed this one woman who wrote a book about her grandfather who was still living, 96 years old, wow. okay, and went from the, from the Normandy back home, like, but went all mm -hmm. through from until, you know, and he's one of the last. I mean, yeah, I thought that it yeah, was, I've it been able to meet too. one or two, but they're, oh God, they're, they're leaving us so quickly now. Um, yeah. And yeah. uh, but but to your point, absolutely. I can't think of another. I mean, obviously, there are so many incredible political and, and social events, and you know, the Great Depression, and I mean, World War One, which we I think kind of overlook a bit unfairly here, um, which is a bigger deal in other countries than it is here. But uh, <clears throat> World War Two just has. I mean, people could writers could engage with that topic for the next 50 years and still not exhaust everything. It's, it's, uh, there were just so many people involved and uh, so many things going on on different continents that uh, uh, fortunately, if, if that's uh, your interest area, there's, there's no, uh, no sign of, of the well-run drive. <laughs> and um, so when I started reading this, I picked this one first because you had written it in 2010. So I thought, all right, I'll start here with um, – after I had read The Devil's Mercedes, I, I wanted to go back, and I was like, I'll start with your first one. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the first question I had for you was, how, what made you think of this? What made you think of FDR Funeral Train, that that would be a story that you could – Yeah, it's, a, it's a little strange. It's, um, I grew up in a very small town uh, in uh, central upstate New York, and uh, – uh, we were about a 40-minute drive from the FDR estate in Hyde Park. Mm. And so every time my parents had out-of-town guests, of course, there was absolutely nothing to do with these people unless they just wanted to go for a walk in the woods. Uh, so we would frequently get in the car and go to the FDR estate. So I had a childhood uh, that, that was uh, characterized by many trips to this, uh, to this beautiful house and museum, and unlike most kids who roll their eyes and when their parents drag them to museums, I, I happen to really enjoy going. And so uh, I, I really felt a, an attachment to FDR. So when I decided to write a book, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to deal with something familiar, and I, FDR felt familiar with me, uh, mm -hmm. to me. And uh, the other thing, and this is this is kind of embarrassing, but uh, you know, I when an author starts out, there there really isn't any money in the offing. Uh, I mean, I got a small advance, 
But, uh, you know, I, I had to pretty much do this on my own, and I didn't want to pick a topic that would require me to get on an airplane, uh, you know, to go across the world because I couldn't afford it. So, uh, you know, fortunately, I could get on the train from New York City and get up to Hyde Park, and without too much trouble, I could stay with my parents. <laughs> so I actually had a very <laughs> economical idea with that. As far as the train specifically, I have to credit uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, who's incomparable book, yeah. No Ordinary Time, was one that mm-hmm. I, I think I've read it three times. But there's a part of the end of that book, uh, and I mean, really, toward the end, it was after FDR died, and she talked about the funeral train, and she gave the funeral train, I think, maybe like a ten-line paragraph or something. And I hit that, at, and I just, I stubbed my toe on that paragraph, because I thought, wait a minute, hold on. The entire federal government was on a train for three days, <laughs> you know? And I thought, there's, oh my God, like, it's not, of course, I went to Amazon, like, well, somebody must have done a book about this, but nobody had. Um, and I thought, well, I guess this is something I should think about. And uh, so that that was the genesis of the idea. Um, the scary thing was that I really wasn't sure if there would be enough for a book. And uh, my agent actually had a difficult time selling the idea because a number of publishers uh, said exactly that to him. That this, this doesn't sound like there's enough here for a book. And he said, no, you don't know who you're dealing with, but they didn't listen. <laughs> um, so right. uh, fortunately, I did find enough. And, and uh, in fact, after the books come out, I found even more. But you have to kind of leave things alone at a certain point. Yeah, I'm sure. But, okay, the detail in this book, and I am, like, I am a detailed person, okay? I'm yeah, one of those I, that, I, as you, you can know, tell, I kind of am too. Um, yeah, as, like, as you can tell, and I'm always like, well, what about that? Well, you answer. That's why you're my favorite. You really are. Like you're okay, my, Not only do you agree to do. talk to me, which, you know, <laughs> but you also. Well, there's that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you also, when you're, you're writing, I mean, I knew from Devil's Mercedes that I was going to love your books because I'm one of those people that it's like, don't just give me a statement and then throw it away. Like, I want to go into that. You know, your sentences, you don't just give throwaway sentences that I'm like, wait, what What happened? And I start, because, no, you everything relates back, and I come out with no questions. So except for the ones I'm, I'm going to give you, but, you know, like, I come right, out with Right, right, right. Or knowing. except for why on earth did this guy bother? Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, I, it's funny because I reread the FDR book. I'm, I'm rereading it now because I have to – I've been invited to, to write an essay about the funeral train for a publication, and I'm like, oh, my cow, I haven't – you know, I, I haven't picked that book up in a while. Um, so I was rereading it the other day. And uh, I, I thought, God, you know, like really give people a lot to slog through here. Um, but uh, but it, it, it does it still moves. So I, I was I'm I'm still happy with it. Uh, I am an extremely detail oriented uh, person, and I, I guess writer, um, but not not for the wrong reasons. Uh, the the thing that's always upset me about uh, history writing. Uh, especially in the hands of, uh, this is going to sound really conceited, I don't mean it to, but but in the hands Mm -hmm. of people who don't really know how to do it, um, Mm -hmm. is they do a whole lot of research, and and they have a list of uh, of facts and details, and then they feel compelled to shoehorn all of these things into the prose, whether it's relevant or not. Um, Mm -hmm. And so you, you strike these passages where a character is introduced, and then we have to go back up their family tree for four generations, um, <laughs> you know, even though there's no reason to do that. Um, and I, I can't help but think that the writer is just like, well, I just did this research, damn it, and it's going in, you know. And I'm like, well, that's not fair, you know. So what I do is I, I'm very, very interested in detail because I'm very interested in, in creating a sense of place. Um, and I, I, I want to go into the world that I'm writing about. And because I don't write fiction and I don't make things up, uh, I want to bring people into that world in a completely accurate fashion, which requires um, an enormous amount of ancillary research, not just the historical kind. But and, and, and So the FDR book was where I first kind of indulged that uh, theory, that idea, to see if I could do it. Um, and among other things that I did uh, was 
you know, I mean, looking at, uh, uh, you know, pictures of uh, all the places or visiting as many as I could. Um, and it, it's uh, Hyde Park, for example. Uh, I mm-hmm. went to Hyde Park uh, in mid-April, right around the time that the funeral train would have been there. I, I walked down to those railroad tracks. I found the original route that the caisson had taken, and I walked back up through those woods. They have not been touched since 1945. Um, and so yeah. you, there's this remarkable experience that you can have uh, where the same skunk cabbage is growing and the same winds are blowing and, 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 and you're there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, with a bunch of other people, chartered uh, a heavyweight Pullman sleeping car, the Dover Harbor, out of Washington, D.C., um, and I took that car uh, through the south, and I sat in a stateroom with the door closed, with my eyes closed, just to get a feel of what it's like to have a heavyweight Pullman of that vintage rolling across the rails, to wow. feel it, to, to hear the sounds of it. Um, so it's extremely important to me to not only provide historic detail, but atmospheric detail. And, uh, and, and so every color that I mention, I'm not just inferring it. No, I know that that was the color. Uh, if I talk about the clothes people are wearing, that is exactly what they were wearing. Uh, it's it's important to me, and so um, I I'm pleased that 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 it met with your approval because I I worry sometimes <laughs> that I hit people with a bit too much. Um, I, I it's almost like going to the perfume counter and trying everything on at the same time. Uh, it can feel that way, but uh, no, I that that's that's deliberate on my part. Well, the, you know, when I was asking some people, um, and I really wish. You know, now that I'm doing so much of this research and and everything on World War II, I'm like, oh, I wish I would have asked my grandparents, you know, more questions. Yeah, like, oh, you know, tell like, me, oh my you... God, this is it's a total, it's such a regret of mine. It's such a regret because my, uh, I, all my grandparents are gone, and uh, I come from a, a family from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they were they were hardcore drinking, smoking steel mill working people and they tend not to last very long. Um, um and so, you know, they they started dropping when I was a little kid and I didn't have the wherewithal to ask. And now I hear all these family legends which are absolutely impossible to verify. <laughs> and, right. And I, I wish I had sat down and had those conversations. Um and yeah. uh, that was actually a regret of mine too with this with the at the R book because I, I I came to the topic late. I, I couldn't have come to it in time. I would have been not old enough to write a book. But I mean, there's just nobody left, um, you know, uh, that 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 would have been on that train. Uh, you know, there weren't children on that train. The youngest person right. on the train would have been Margaret Truman, and she passed away a few years before, uh, only a few years, but a few years before I started writing. And uh, I'm not sure I'd have had access to her anyway. Uh, very Did fortunately. She have I, you know what? That's a really great question. There is a Roosevelt grandchild, uh, Clifton Daniel. Uh, I'm, I'm not getting his full name. I know he's around. Um, I, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. A, a Truman grandchild, yes, because I've seen him do things at the Truman uh, Library. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was speaking at the Truman Library uh, a couple of months ago, and I saw uh, that he had been there. So I know that he's around. Um, but here's the thing. I was very lucky because many of the people who were on this train, I, for reasons I, I, I can only speculate on, they, were, they kept diaries. They kept journals. And that is the biggest gift in the world uh, to a researcher like me because the newspapers will give you the first draft of history, to borrow that old saying. Um, but the newspapers, especially back then, they didn't indulge the kind of detail that you read now. Um, they also weren't all that heavy on quotes, and um, they certainly didn't ask people how they felt about anything most of the time. Uh, so if you get a journal entry from somebody where they're recounting a personal experience, it is just pure gold. And fortunately for me, I was able to find quite a few of those. Some of them were published, some of them weren't. Uh, but that was how I created a lot of those, rather recreated a lot of the scenes aboard the funeral train, is that those were not in the newspapers. Yeah, I, I mean, because you have such detail. And I was thinking, I mean, I'm in Pennsylvania, and my grandparents were all here in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And I would have loved to ask them, like, you know, it wasn't that far to go to Philly. You know, did any of them care enough or, right. or what was, yeah. you know, 
what yeah. what was their take on it. I just but I did ask a couple of my friends that um are history buffs like me and I'm like, mm-hmm. Did you ever hear about the you know, the funeral train? They're like yeah. Oh yeah, I heard about it but, but they didn't know. They they really yeah. didn't. There's so little that people yeah, you know, it's the train that picked him up and took him, mm-hmm. you know, to Hyde Park or, you know, took him to his funeral and then to Hyde Park. But um not a lot of people know the detail about it and that's what I love about this book is because it gets into um well, it gets into how he died. I mean, it starts with, you know, what happened, which, you know, we all kind of know, but I, I got to learn a lot more about that. And mm-hmm. then um, and then into Truman, because I didn't know that Truman was on that train. Oh, here's you know? the thing. I, ga- I took a gamble on this. I had just – I mean, it, looking back on this now, I think I must have been – I. I mean, I was naive when I had started this, and I'm very grateful that I was because I don't think I would do it now. Um I made the assumption when I started this book that, well, with so many important people stuffed together on a single train, something must have happened, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and very fortunately for me, a lot of things did happen, but I didn't know when I first mm-hmm. started um, if it was going to be anything. I mean, for I really, I, I wouldn't. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised if everybody had just sat in their in their Pullman berths and 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 snivelled the whole way, you know. Um, I mean, it would have been understandable. But I, as soon as I found out that Truman was on the train, I was like, you know, there's there, there's got to be. It was like his, his administration was what two days old or something like that. I, right. There's got to be some kind of political machinations at work. There just has to be. And and it turns out that there was. And and uh, the the speech that Truman composed on the train, which is, I mean, one of the great American <laughs> political speeches, which is completely forgotten now, you know. But, I mean, that was an enormously important event. Is Nobody in the country knew who the hell Tr- Harry Truman was unless they were from Missouri. Um, and, you know, he, he was an unknown quantity. He was untested. And, uh, and, and people were terrified. They had had FDR as their leader. Even if they didn't like FDR, they were used to him for 12 years. And all of a sudden there's this guy in there. Who the hell is Harry Truman? And now he's not only running the country but essentially – uh, helming World War II, right? Right. Uh, as commander in chief, and Truman understood the importance of making a statement to the American public, even though his advisor said it's too soon. FDR just died. You won't look good doing this, and he didn't listen to them. And because he had no time to compose the speech to to plan what he was going to do, uh, he had to do it on the train. And that set the stage for a wonderful little plot line that I could begin um, that, it, in a sense, had nothing to do with the Roosevelt funeral at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I would kept thinking about was, you know, I watched the movie Truman when it came out a while mm-hmm. ago. And I was like, was that even in the movie? Was it in the movie that that's how he started his presidency? I don't remember. I, I don't. Can you know what? I don't know it. either. <laughs> I mean, but it, in who knows? I mean, in a movie, they have to take so much out. You right, know. they do. Um, they so they only hit the high points, and uh, uh, this, you know, it's funny too because I was just thinking this while we were talking. You know, there, there are other famous funeral trains. Um, uh, you know, obviously Lincoln's, and mm-hmm. even though he wasn't president, Bobby Kennedy. Uh, which is, you know, that's been in the news recently. That that incredible yeah. book of Magnum photographs has been uh, has been top of mind for for some journalists. And it just got me thinking, like, there's no way that my formula doesn't apply. Like, there's no way that interesting stuff wasn't going on on board those trains. Um, right. You know, but the difference is that, well, of course, Bobby Kennedy wasn't president, so that's kind of been, puts a little bit right. out of my, my interest area, although I am fascinated with Bobby Kennedy. And with Lincoln, it, it's so scary when you go back really, really far, then you 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 just you run into research challenges that are ones that, that I can deal with. But uh, Victorian-era journalism is uh, it's a little dicey. It's a frequently threaded yeah. with opinion. People, journalists made things up and that kind of thing. So uh, this was perfect for me because it was it was really – uh, the modern era, what I consider the modern era, uh, and uh, we were in the information age, although obviously not the internet age yet, and uh, you know we were in a mass media age in 1945, at least in terms of radio and uh, and wire services and newspapers, and beautifully, people who were in the government were, uh, God help us, literate. They read books, 
and they, they wrote letters and they kept journals. And these are things that I have to make this point. I feel very bad in many ways for the historians that will come uh, later because I, where will they find those troves of letters and journals that I, of the kind that I rely on to, to write a book like this? You know? right, exactly, because people aren't writing. It's people be aren't very writing, hard. and, and yeah, they write email, but then they delete it, and delete you can't it. get it. Yeah. And, you know, how many people print out their emails and save them, you know? I mean, I, it's like nobody, right? right? So, you know, you have uh, a whole uh, body of work that would become archival material that is now not going to become archival material, and that's very frightening. So I was very fortunate to have these characters, to have these people um, who cared about writing letters and who cared about posterity and who kept these journals, and, and I was able to enter the funeral train, uh, in, in, in obviously in, a, in, in a, a figurative sense, but, but in a very real sense. Mm -hmm. I have to say there were, there were a couple of things that really shocked me, and, you know, I, I haven't done a huge amount of research on FDR, but, you know, in, in reading and watching YouTube and, yeah. and different things on him um, for just my own interest, some of the, there were some things that were really shocking to me. And one of them was the fact that Eleanor was so concerned on the, you know, when she gets to the White House, that she's so concerned about who he was with when yeah. he died. Yeah. I had, I, I thought, okay, from the research that I'd done on Eleanor before, and, and like I said, watching YouTube videos and documentaries and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I thought she had really kind of come to terms at that point about their marriage. Because they really didn't spend yeah, a lot she of time had. together. She, she had. It's just that um, she had assumed, incorrectly, that Franklin had honored uh, the agreement that the two of them made uh, once the affair had been uncovered, that uh, as, as one of Eleanor's conditions for staying in that marriage, and the marriage had to stay together if FDR was going to have any kind of political career or any kind of inheritance, one of Eleanor's conditions was that he would stop seeing uh, Lucy Mercer, and mm -hmm. uh, and she found out. Although I, you know, was it was it still not clear exactly when or how she found out. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, the, the best I could find was that El Elliot Roosevelt speculated that her first night in Warm Springs, she had pieced the information together. Um, so uh, she knew very early on that. Um, that FDR had been duplicitous uh, for all of these years after he had, you know, supposedly made amends with her. And the, the, but the, the worst thing for Eleanor was that she had also found out that her own daughter had right. been part of that conspiracy, part of that cover-up, and that was profoundly hurtful to her. Um, and so I, I, I mean, it's hard to imagine what she would have been going through because I know that, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, one assumes that she mm -hmm. did still love, you know, FDR on, on, on whatever level that one could after having, you know, had a broken marriage. They they were all but lifelong companions, right? I mean, uh, right. uh, certainly for their adult lives. And so she's lost him and then found out that the man that she's lost has been perpetrating a lie for the, you know, the last however many decades uh, and that her her favorite child, the one she was the closest to, had been in on it, uh, and so that is like a, in a sense it was a triple whammy. Uh, right. And then on top of that, because of her Victorian breeding, she understood or felt that she had to uh, maintain appearances for the sake of the public. So she did not show any emotion in public, uh, and she held herself up. Um, it must have been absolutely crippling uh, emotionally. Yeah, and and I was thinking, okay, this is, may sound, you know, this is just going to be <laughs> our opinion, but I'm mm. thinking, okay, he's not well, okay, everybody knows he's not well. So the relationship that he had with Lucy at that time, I mean, wasn't it just also pretty much a companion relationship? Yeah, yeah I, I think there's every reason to believe that that's all that it was, and I, and I, I understand what you're saying. I think that, that you know, I mean, can you can you give the guy you know a, a a companion for tea for heaven's sake you know like, <laughs> was there so much harm in it right um, right and and I yeah I agree I mean if if the marriage was a marriage on paper if a, if it was simply a marriage for the cameras as it as it was 
Um, mm-hmm. If it was just a political marriage, and politically they were an enormously successful couple, um, you know, w- would it have been such a big deal for for him to, you know, have seen her a few times? I mean, that, that was certainly uh, Polly Delano's feeling, um, you know, like essentially, and she even said as much, all but as much to Eleanor, like, you know, when, and what's wrong with that? You know, mm-hmm. what's wrong with the man having a little bit of company? And and in that acidic comment was also the, the weighty suggestion that Eleanor was always on the road. She was never in the White House. Right. She had she had neglected FDR, and that has also been a, an off-voiced uh, criticism of her. You know, what would you expect the man to do, right? Um, mm-hmm. So, yes, it, it's a complicated thing, and I it's, it's not that – I don't take a side, and frankly, I can I can countenance both points of view. Exactly. Um, I, and I think that it was uh, look. I mean, you know, it's a, obviously an enormously emotionally fraught um, situation, and uh, I, I I I do find myself feeling for Eleanor because I, she was such an honorable woman, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, if perhaps a little prudish, and uh, you know, but occasionally a bit of a stick in the mud. But, uh, you know, that she felt betrayed, and if that was her feeling, then obviously I, you know, one has to give that to her. Exactly. And But I'm thinking, you know, with her traveling schedule, it isn't like now, you know? Like, you don't just go away for a night or come back or, I mean... Oh, God, no. I mean, she would be gone for weeks at a time because that's yeah. what it took. I mean, if you right. wanted to get across the country in the United States in 1945... Uh, if you wanted to go to Los Angeles, uh, you, it would take three days to get there, um, right. you know, on the fastest trains. And, uh, you know, Eleanor was, uh, uh, she was all over the place. I don't know if you've seen that famous cartoon of those two coal miners at the bottom of the mine. And one of them says to the other one, oh, look, here comes Mrs. Roosevelt. Um, because she had gone down into a coal mine. And she had she had gone places no first lady had ever been. Right. Um, and she enjoyed it. She did like working, and she did like traveling. It gave her a sense of purpose. But it also took her away from the White House for enormous periods of time, and that created its own problems. Yeah. And she was wasn't she really like the first um, first lady to be as active as she was with as many causes as she had? Oh yeah, yeah. And I mean, she was unabashedly political. Um, and uh, I, so she was a trailblazer in every mm-hmm. sense, and, mm-hmm. uh, and and continued to be. I mean, she she had her own newspaper column, <laughs> right? By day, which is enormously boring to read. I, like it's, it's it's really boring, and <laughs> is it, it, it's, but it's a testament to how important and influential she was. That that you would get a nationally syndicate. I mean, she was in all of these newspapers all over the country, and her column was basically like, "Well, here's what I did today." And I mean, it wasn't like, "Well, I bought a new pair of shoes" or something like that. But you know, I mean, it was it was these meandering, you know, uh, reflection on this, and you know, a platitude here and there, and and that was it. You know, uh, she wasn't a great writer. But it didn't matter because what she said and what she thought was enormously influential, and uh, and and I the first ladies did not play that role prior to Eleanor. Her. They did a, a little bit, uh, a little bit. Uh, Mrs. Coolidge was uh, was quite a firecracker, and uh, but you know you just didn't have that kind of not only before Eleanor, but to some degree. Not after. I mean, Mamie Eisenhower uh, had famously said that uh, it was. Was it Mamie Eisenhower or was it uh, Beth Truman? One, I forget now. One of them said a uh, 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 first lady's job is to to keep her hat on straight and sit next to her husband and shut up. Um, <laughs> so you know, I mean, Eleanor was was way ahead of her times because uh, after her in the 50s, uh, it kind of reverted. Um, you know, back to this, uh, back to the belief that you know women should be seen and not heard. So, um, yeah, I I credit her with a great deal. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting that we're talking about this today in light of what has happened this weekend in Virginia because she she was very active in in giving him information about what was going on in the South. Where she, oh, yeah. Whether, yeah. whether he wanted to know about it or not, whether, whether he did know about it or not, it, it seemed like – she was the one that was always in his ear saying, you have to know about this. This is something that we yeah, have to deal she, with. And that was, the, 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 you know, that was in the 40s. It's yeah, crazy yeah. that we're still dealing with this. Crazy. Yeah, that yeah. Have. The role that she played was, it was very interesting because Roosevelt, obviously, he could get 
intelligence, right? And and he mm-hmm. certainly read the newspapers. But those channels don't do a very good job in in imparting the feeling of the man on the street. And it, that was held, that was the information that Eleanor was able to supply. She had mm-hmm. a common touch. She got out. She moved among the people. She talked to them, and she heard their concerns. She knew what was on the public's mind, and that's what she brought back to FDR. And that mm-hmm. was the sort of information that he wasn't going to read in the New York Times. And, uh, and, and, and she enabled him to be the politically astute creature that he was. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, the, the other thing that shocked me was at the end of the book when she was realizing that she wasn't going to be able to afford everything that, you know, all their properties. And, and right, it kind of yeah. shocked me because I really looked at him. I, I couldn't understand why she couldn't afford what, you know, well, why it she was, had to worry. Well, here's the thing. There's a, there a few aspects to it. The Roosevelts were well-to-do, but they were not enormously wealthy. I mean, it, it was old money. And uh, so Roosevelt came in for an inheritance, but remember, he parted with, I think, almost two-thirds of it uh, to purchase the Warm Springs property to begin the Polio Foundation down there. Oh, right. So he depleted his own yeah. fortune considerably. Now, mm-hmm. there was still a certain amount left, mm-hmm. but there wasn't enough left to maintain that enormous house, all of that property. I mean, that property had a working farm on it, for heaven's sake. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there were staffers to pay, and... Um, that was an that was huge, and then of course you had the estate tax, which you know that was something that Roosevelt favored, um, and the estate tax eventually came and and pretty much wiped out his own estate. Um, but you know that was something that that Roosevelt had always kind of anticipated would happen. I remember reading somewhere, if my memory serves me correctly, that he had said. Um, I, I don't believe that the house will – you'll be able to maintain the house in the style, um, you know, that it was designed to be maintained, like all that property, all those servants and everything. Um, and so what had happened was that there was a provision made for Eleanor to have the cottage, Valkill, on that property, um, and the house and the rest of the property was ceded to, uh, to the state, and it, which is what happened with so many uh, great estates in the country. Um, mm. That's how the Parks Department has so many fantastic historic sites, um, right. because uh, many old money fortunes, Gilded Aid fortunes in particular, um, you know, they they were broken up, and then the estate tax took some of it. Uh, but mainly, it was like dividing the inheritance among so many descendants that that it's it's an inevitable consequence of a fortune. Um, getting older, unless it's extremely aggressively reinvested by people who know what they're doing, you know, mm-hmm. the fortune tends to get spread thinner and thinner, and it cannot uh, maintain that kind of lavish baronial lifestyle that was common at the turn of the last century, um, when a lot of these places were also built before there was even an income tax, right? So, right. you know, there was that as well. So, yeah, Eleanor ended up having to sell FDR's stamp collection to pay the estate taxes and to settle up. Uh, but, you know, she always, she was she was provided for. She was comfortable. She had that cottage, um, and she did have, uh, I don't know exactly if a trust was set up for her. I'm almost certain that one was, and um, or a certain amount, you know, an, an annuity of some I kind. I think that I remember. Yeah, I think it was like 8000 right? Yeah. 8000 a year? And, and she didn't need, I mean, remember, she had income from, uh, her speaking engagements and that kind of thing. Uh, mm-hmm. So she 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 was fine. She was fine, and she didn't want to be a wealthy woman. Uh, she wanted to be a politically active woman. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's weird. It's and, and it's it's kind of sad because you know you see uh, the difficulties right after the death of FDR, including something that you wouldn't expect it to include, which was kind of like a crisis over his estate. Um, you know, over how those taxes were going to be paid, how everything was going to be divvied up. Uh, I forget where I found those papers, but I was very excited when I found them <laughs> because <laughs> it puts a kind of human face on this, right? Because you you tend to view these figures as you know as though they're walking on the clouds above us, right? 
And right. uh, no, in many ways, they they had uh, you know the Roosevelts had all the problems that, uh, that 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 every family has. Yes, and I loved when uh, when when she met Truman for the first time afterwards, and and he gave her his condolences, and she said, I, you know, really, I need to give you <laughs> like you're the one. Oh who yeah, needs she's prayers. The, yeah, she's he, he asked her if it was any, if there was anything he could do for her. Oh, and she right, said, is right. there anything we can do for you because yeah. you're the one in trouble now? <laughs> and I just thought that, you know, I mean, the humor and the empathy and the wisdom in just that phrase, you know, right. um, it's, it's priceless. It's just priceless. She, she was she was a gem. So was Truman. These were incredible people. Um, they really were. They're so exciting to, like, read about at now. And, yeah, yeah. You know, well, I can't wait to talk Truman with you because we have to talk about Oh, I'd about love to talk Truman, Truman next, with you. In the next interview. <laughs> but I was thinking about um, also, I guess if anybody can relate how this affected the country it, right now, I mean, if we would have had Obama for 12 years, we only had him for eight, but if we yeah. would have had him for 12 and he would have died in office, like imagine how attached, because in eight years we were attached to him and we're having a hard time transitioning out of Obama and so I was like trying to realize like that's another four years and he dies in office and we're in the middle of a war and you know you add all that together that's why you know that's why it affected our country so deeply yeah here this is what's interesting the the a lot of people in the United States did not like FDR I mean it's something that it, it it's so easy to overlook this um the if you were uh, an industrialist, if you were a fiscal conservative uh, or, or even a social conservative, you probably weren't all that thrilled with FDR. And mm-hmm. uh, and then there were people who who just that there were people who wouldn't say his name. They just talked to they referred to him as that man in the White House. I mean, there there, there were people who didn't like him. However, um, at that time in the United States, when most people were what today we would call working class. We would call blue-collar tradesmen, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There was an enormous popular support for Roosevelt. And the public outpouring of grief that you saw in connection with the funeral train, where people would stand by the tracks for hours on their feet waiting for this train to come, just for the chance to, to see a train to take their hat off for four seconds as this train passed, People drove hundreds of miles to do this. It's hard to imagine something like that happening now. Mm-hmm. And I struggle to explain why was, you know, what was, behind, what was behind this. Some of it was that he had been president for a very long time. Uh, and no doubt a lot of it was that he was commander-in-chief and we were in the middle of a war. That was huge. But another big thing, which I think was people tend to overlook by 1945, but Roosevelt had come in uh, at, the, at the very, very start of the worst period of the Great Depression. Right. And it was the New Deal programs that, you know, people back then, and in fact in my own family, my grandmother used to say this, that, you know, FDR kept people from starving to death. Right. And, you know, people didn't just hear that and believe it. They lived it. Mm-hmm. And so there were people in this country that didn't just support FDR politically, but believed that they owed their lives to him, that they owed their, their children's lives to him. There were pictures of FDR that would hang up in the kitchens of America. I mean, it, it's hard to imagine. Can you imagine going to somebody's home now and seeing a picture of a president hanging <laughs> up in somebody's kitchen? I mean, it's just crazy, right? But But people did. And, you know, so I think when he died – it was something that came as such a personal blow to people in a way that I don't really know we, if we have the capacity to understand it now. Mm-hmm. Um, because of the particular arc of history that he was in charge through, um, he happened to be a, a central figure in two enormous events, two of arguably the, two of the most enormous events in American history, the Great Depression and World War II. And he was the man. He was the man at the helm. Um, There were – I've seen these. There's uh, desk clocks. Um, I forget what company made them. They go for a great deal of money on eBay. Uh, It's a clock in the middle of a ship's wheel, and there's FDR as a sea captain holding onto that wheel and steering it. Wow. Um, You know, that is how people felt. Mm -hmm. And so when he died, 
it was it was a, a gut punch to people, and uh, I, I think that explains some of the the incredible scenes of grief at trackside. Um, and there's one other thing that I think is unique to this experience that if if to use your example, if President Obama, uh, you know, had been in office 12 years and he had died tragically or, or, or whatever the circumstance, you know, you would have a state funeral in Washington D.C. Um, mm-hmm. And you would have, if he were buried in Chicago, you would have a plane that would take the the right. casket there. You right. would not have a That's railroad, true. and that right. was the wonder of the railroad: is that mm-hmm. it was accessible. It wasn't an airport. It wasn't at 33,000 feet. It wasn't behind a security cordon. Um, and you could go to this trackside and interact in a way uh, with the dead president. And mm-hmm. it just it, the last time something of this magnitude happened that, that we have a, a reference for, as I had mentioned at the top of our conversation, was, was Bobby Kennedy's funeral train in 1968. Um, and that was that didn't go very far. I mean, it, it went up to New York, I think from oh now I don't know exactly what the two points, but it was a very limited uh, East Coast run. Mm-hmm. Um, the Roosevelt funeral train went from the Deep South all the way up, yeah. almost into yeah. all, almost into New England, because Hyde Park is you know your your stone's throw from Connecticut on there. Right. And um, you know, so this was a great cross section of the country, and also an area where FDR enjoyed. Uh, an enormous amount of popularity. The East Coast, the the historical elite, liberal East Coast, um, right? And you know, so this was this was his base. And yes, he still had. The, the, remember, this was before the South turned Republican. You still had Southern Democrats that were a huge political force. Um, that wouldn't change until Lyndon Johnson pushed the civil rights legislation through and lost the South uh, to the Democrats, um, who were, uh, you know, it, 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 it turned red, as we talk about now. And so it was a very different country in a very different time. Well, I'm so happy you wrote this book, because out of everything that I ever read about or saw, you know, on YouTube or any other documentaries. I mean, it took the last part of his life. It answered so many questions and, and filled in so many blanks for me. And for anybody who loves reading about him, this is an important book to finish off with, I think. So, well, thank you. I opinion. appreciate it. <laughs> and, I, and I don't want to say, I don't have to say goodbye to you because we will be talking again because okay. I can't wait to talk Truman with you. And, Very and good. just, you know, thank you so much for talking to me. And I will have his links um, so you, where you can get the book and, and to our other conversation. And we will talk again soon. Super. Thanks again, Michelle. Appreciate uh, okay. it. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Have a great Bye-bye. day. Bye-bye.